Good morning, everybody. Sort of uh, jumping the gun to run up here for Chris because Bernard, as usual, went over. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the Savannah hypothesis, and I'm going to describe what it is and sort of go through time how it was created and then how we look at it today. But first, what I'd like to do is play a game with you. And you can't lose the game. It's just sort of like a survey game. Um, so I'm going to show pictures, and I want you to raise your hand if whatever the picture is looks like a savanna to you. Ready? What about this? Is this a savanna? OK. What about this? OK. This? <laughs> this? Can you tell I like wild dogs? Um, and what about this? OK. And finally, this one. Well, guess what? You're all correct. Because the definition of a savanna, especially in Africa, is a habitat that has grass as a ground cover. It can have trees. It can have close together trees or far apart trees. It can have bushes. It can have uh, shrubs. It can have forbs in any estimation of woody cover because anything that's not a grass is actually woody cover. And so I thought that if we're going to talk about the savanna hypothesis, we should know what a savanna is. OK. So some early comments on uh, the savanna hypothesis. I just want to say that I realize I have three um, European men up here. And I acknowledge that evolution itself actually started long before these people with the Greeks. The Greeks had ideas with Aristotle, passed on to the Romans. And then interestingly, during the European Dark Ages, uh, in the Golden Age of Islam, Muslim scholars actually have a lot of interesting things to read about evolution. And Charles Darwin has read those um, documents. And I thank my friend and colleague Sheila Athrea for pointing that out. In any case, back to the Savannah hypothesis, Lamarck, uh, who in 1809 said that a quadrupedal um, ape, arboreal ape, could only become um, a biped in terrestrial biome as the trees disappeared, which was very interesting. That was 1809. Charles Darwin never says anything about grasses necessarily um, because he talked about bipedalism and uh, ha had to have a selective advantage. And uh, he did, however, say that that habitat should, whatever that was, and that where the bipedalism occurred was in Africa. And then um, <laughs> Gustav Stein, Stein, I can't even read my writing here, Steinman, um, was a geologist who talked about, yes, it was bipedalism in an open savanna, and then that caused our brain to grow, and we had better senses in our hands. And it's like it went, we walked out onto the savanna and became human immediately. So, but all these were pretty early on, these different um, people. So prior to this time, and I think that it's very interesting that um, these, all these talks overlap. I probably could say, well, OK, refer to. Uh, Don's talk, refer to Berner's talk, but um, prior to the African fossils in the northern hemisphere, we knew about Homo erectus, uh, Neanderthals, and Homo heidelbergensis. And Britain had their own fossil that you don't hear about today. <laughs> that was, in fact, Piltdown. That was found at the site of Piltdown. And it was several um, pieces of a human skull that was found what we know today with an orangutan mandible, which was turned out to be uh, a hoax. Um, that wasn't even found to be a forgery until 1953. When I was in grade school in Michigan, I uh, remember learning about this, not in 1953. It was a little later. But, <laughs> But I, I, I don't know whether to be happy that they actually had something about evolution in the textbook or sad because the textbook must have been really old by the time I read that. In any case, why am I talking about this? So in 1916, Henry Fairfield Osborne, who was director at one time of the American Museum of Natural History, wrote a book called The Dawn Man. And his idea of this was that they had all suffered through this ape-human split. And now he has come up with this, this fabulous idea um, 
of the aristocracy of man back into the fold. And this is the beginning. Um, and he suggested that in the Oligocene, which is about 30 million years ago, was the split between apes and humans. And humans would be found, uh, human fossils probably originated in the, in the grassland, but in the steppes of Asia. And they originated with horses because he studied horses. <laughs> I don't mean to. Anyway, so, so these, this is what's going on for when, as you all know by now, uh, Raymond Dart was brought the Tong child in uh, 1924. So it's his, the 100 year anniversary of his acknowledgement of that, but it took him till all the way till February to um, write this paper in science. But he realized that this tiny little um, child um, was, a, was a biped. And um, he wrote, if I can get this to, I just don't see very well, so. Um, so Southern Africa, by providing a vast open country with occasional wooded belts and a relatively, relative scarcity of water was, together with a fierce and bitter mammalian competition, furnished a laboratory such as was essential to this penultimate phase of human evolution. They don't write science articles like that anymore. Um, but the point of that, there's two things. Um, A, that uh, he me mentions this vast savanna, this open landscape. And also, he said, this is the penultimate phase of human evolution. This was the ancestor to us, is what he was saying at that time. So basically, the divergence between um, other great apes and hominids was driven by the appearance and subsequent use of savannas by hominids. That's the savanna hypothesis. Um, however, all of this, this, these implications are that this is this caused bipedalism, right? It's like you, you just if you're walking out there, maybe you came bipedal before, then walked, who knows? But search in Africa in the 30s, um, we've already heard about Robert Broom, who was looking in all these caves of, in southern Africa. And incidentally, he used to go into these caves and take all his clothes off, whatever. Um, and he also worked with uh, John Robinson, who came to southern Africa later. And then, of course, we get to the Leakies in eastern Africa. Um, and then eventually, in the late 60s, we had that expedition to the Omo. So people are now looking across the um, savannas. So in the 60s and 70s, people started referring to not the savanna as just plain or the grassland. They started referring to it as savanna mosaics. And this was an interesting quote by Amadeus um, Gravo. Um, but he said that the only conceivable change that he could think of that would actually cause the bipedalism is that the, the apes didn't leave the trees. The trees left the apes. So it had to do something with climate change. And so there were people then, Robert Ardry still wrote about grasslands, but people like Cliff Jolly, Desmond Clark, um, Nancy Turner talked about savanna mosaics. So there's already a shift in what people are talking about. Okay. So this is Hadar, the site of Hadar. This is our um, aerial photography uh, mechanism, also known as a drone. Uh, and this is Bill Kimball leading people to the Lucy site, marked as a marker now. Uh, and there's Lucy and Don, um, who found this. And this actually happens to be my 30th year anniversary from going to Hadar for the first time. So. Lucy's found, and then we get into some controversies, and Zarai talked about this a little bit, but I'm gonna talk about the polarization of that. And um, there was one group that said Australopithecus afarensis was, was completely bipedal, and the evidence that suggested um, climbing were primitive retentions, and they were not really used. Um, Owen Lovejoy thought this, Bill Kimball thought this, that once you cross a threshold, you were biped and um, you weren't using that because that, that, you didn't need it anymore. The other group, Australopithecus afarensis, was completely bipedal. 
and the retention of longer arms, curved fingers, and toes suggested climbing ability. This was um, mostly, uh, from, from what I remember, was Stern, Doc Stern and Randy Sushman from Stony Brook University, where I went to graduate school. So Jack was a rabid adaptationist. Everything in morphology had to have a use. And so this was the big um, controversy at that time. Now this was, I think, also inspired some inspiration um, for people. Um, because um, if, if Lucy was climbing or not climbing or anything, people sort of had to begin to do, get away from the Savannah hypothesis and figure out other ways that this might have um, occurred. So, all right. Um, and in the beginning, the Savannah hypothesis was for early hominids, right? because they, they became bipeds. But then we started getting other um, suggestions. OK, so maybe they were standing up uh, to look for predators in tall grass, or um, was freeing the hands for carrying tools, or freeing the hands for provisioning mates. So these are all hypotheses that came about during this time period. Um, standing up, dissipating heat, have to do something. Baboons don't have to dissipate heat, however. Or maybe they were walking between patches of food as the trees disappeared. This is in yellow because I favor this one, especially if this was um, a suspensory ape, at least for the first use of savannas. But what hominid are these people talking about? This was, um, uh, so this is me um, uh, in Hadar in um, not in, not in 1994, but um, so as I was at Stony Brook, I thought, okay, if I pick a dissertation that looks at whether or not there were trees in the habitats that were uh, around the fossil sites, if I could find a way to reconstruct these habitats, at least I could show whether there were trees to climb or not. If there were no trees, there's no big deal, right? <laughs> okay, they didn't climb. If there were trees, I couldn't prove that they climbed them, but at least that they were there. Um, and then I got to go, this is me um, with the 444 skull when I first went there. And you can see by the look on my face, I'm terrified I'm going to drop it. Um, and at the same time, my friend and colleague Lillian Spencer was also at Stony Brook. And she was also interested in looking at sort of grasslands and when they spread. And, um, she was interested in secondary grasslands. Secondary grasslands are those that are either burned or overgrazed. And both of those things um, show, uh, prevent trees from growing. And so you get the Serengeti type look. It's just this open plain, et cetera. And so what Lillian discovered in hers was that um, by looking at the diet and the morphology, uh, various antelope that the secondary grasslands most likely appeared two million years ago, not with early hominids. And so that was like a different time period. That would be for Homo erectus. Um, I, on the other hand, um, thought that um, the earliest hominids bo had both trees and grasses and some floodplain environments like this. Um, and to various degrees, the Australopithecus that we knew at the, the ah, I'm so sorry, that we knew at that time as early Australopithecus critters. And then we have a new story from Ardipithecus and the Bertelli foot. These um, hominids are definitely hominids, and they have an opposable uh, toe. They have grasping feet. They definitely climbed, and I think that in the long run. This actually shows how this might have occurred with the habitat and with the savanna hypothesis in that um, the African savanna has been important in the evolution of all hominid species, which is not, but not in the same way. And so in the earliest hominids, it was closed woodland, riverine forests, grassland mosaics for Ardipithecus and other earlier species perhaps, for Australopithecus species, woodland, 
not closed woodland, but sort of more open woodland, no opposable uh, toe, riverine forests and grassland mosaics, uh, and then floodplains and secondary grasslands. The secondary grasslands are now here for Homo and Paranthropus species. And I'd actually like to thank a bunch of people. I'd like to thank everybody who, uh, Julie and Aubrey and Lindsay and Sheila I already mentioned, David Fury who just keeps me upright. Um, these, uh, the, these papers, um, all of you for listening to me this morning and um, my friends Omar and Bill that I miss a lot. Thank you. <laughs>